think the, the bravest thing that I've ever done is to chase a skateboard career into my adult life. I learned the value of perseverance through my years of skating. Hawk with the in the air! Through my years of trying to learn these tricks, that a lot of times seems impossible. So when it came to making a living and doing what I had to do, I was ready to persevere and put myself out there. I have no backup plan, so I hope it keeps working. and soul is still in skateboarding, and so I go to a lot of skate events, skate exhibitions, skate park openings. Can you saw a hat, too? It could be a little chaotic. Thank you, Tony, right here. People have these really high expectations of you when you put yourself in this position of being a great skateboarder. I can't say that I'm honestly ever prepared for it. Even at an early, early age, when people came up and said, well, I'm a big fan, he was kind about it. We go up, and sometimes it's like a rock concert. The man himself in right now, no warm up needed. He enjoys what he does. I, I like being around people who enjoy what they do, and Tony is definitely one of those people. If you're a real skateboarder at heart, and you've spent the time, and you put in the time, and you're with guys, and you're going out and taking trips with them, and trying new tricks, and trying to progress the sport, they'll embrace you. And I think Tony has got that genuineness about him. He's been around since the beginning, and this is what he's loved to do. He's the same person I met when he was 12 years old, you know? Just a, a humble kid that, that just loves skateboarding and just wants to skateboard for fun. First time I got a serious injury was when I was 10 years old. I got a concussion, knocked out, knocked my teeth out. And I remember vividly waking up in the ambulance on the way to the hospital and thinking, oh, what trick was I doing? Oh man, I gotta, I gotta learn how to do that better. His relationship with pain is very different than mine. Like it was not, I'm never skating again. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Am I gonna live? Am I gonna? And it was just like, oh, next time I skate, I'm gonna figure out how to do rock and rolls better. Knowing through experience, I know how hard skateboarding is and how dangerous it is and how much it hurts when you fall. And I think that was a defining moment for me and, and really kind of what set the tone in terms of my perseverance and my stubbornness through the years was like, I'm not gonna give up on stuff, even if it, it's to the risk of my own body and health, I'm gonna learn to do these tricks. He was really stubborn. Uh, he had a lot of energy, but was so stubborn that sometimes he was hard to be around. He just needed something to stimulate him. And, and in fact, my parents believe that skateboarding sort of saved that hyperactivity that was going on. My older brother was my link to skateboarding initially because he started skating because he was a surfer in the 70s. And sur skating was sort of bred from surfing, especially pool skating. I had this old Bane fiberglass skateboard called a banana board. And I, I gave it to Tony. It wasn't like he stepped on it and suddenly angels were singing. He was skating in the driveway and little ramps, little two foot ramps, but he discovered a skate park that had been built, a concrete skate park nearby. I saw these guys flying out of into swimming pools and that was my wow moment where I was like, I wanna do whatever they're doing. He saw the challenge and he, and he kind of realized how much effort it was gonna to take to get good at these bigger pools. I was playing Little League at the time. My dad was the president of the Little League of our community. And um, I started skating and then my dad was supportive of that. But at some point, those two things clashed. Tony came to him and said, you know, dad, I don't wanna play baseball anymore. I just wanna skate. Um, and my dad, uh, God bless him, said, okay. Dad sort of um, worked through the season and then spent every single day taking him to that skate park. Frank Hawk, man, he was uh, definitely on the circuit, definitely known as Tony's dad. My dad was very proactive. He saw a lack of organized events in skating at the time, which there were. So he got some of the main skate companies together to at least form a series of skate contests. He was very involved with Tony's life. And I think that's why Tony is who he is, 
because of that love and that support from his family. He just saw what it what it gave me in terms of my self-confidence and my motivation and my passion. But he also saw that it, it gave those same things to a lot of my friends who all felt very out of place. We, we didn't fit in with mainstream sports, with mainstream culture, and we all loved skating. And he, he saw this band of misfits that, that were very creative, um, proactive people and thought they need their own place too. My experience as a pro skater in high school was very isolating. On one end, you have this sense of celebrity. I would go to events and people would ask for my autograph and take pictures. And then I would go to school and I was a ghost in the school hallways. He had teachers telling him, you know, this is the mistake, this skateboarding thing. And he was already making more money than them. He skated differently than, than other skaters. He was very creative and he was doing things kind of thinking outside the box. I was known for creating all these new tricks and in the skate world at the time, that was not cool. That was considered circus stuff. So they literally called me uh, my tricks, circus tricks. It was a style that, that at first people kind of weren't too stoked on. I guess it was my first experience with haters. If nothing else, in hindsight, it benefited me later because I was prepared for the onslaught of, of hate that would come my way for endorsements, for my style, for my age, for my, you know, for, for um, <laughs> so many things. It was hard to watch um, him come to grips with the fact that he was probably the best in his field uh, technically and in terms of athleticism. As he grew up and as he matured, um, it kind of developed into a, a style that people actually mimic now. The well, skateboard fad languished for a while, but it's back now and stronger than ever. High-tech skateboards that go for $150 and up. More people than ever are skateboarding. There are an estimated 10 million so-called wheel hands. When skateboarding started to hit mainstream and movie people started coming out and like Police Academy 4 um, contracted us to, to um, do some stunt work in it. There was Gleam in the Cube, there was Thrashing. It was kind of cool to see how big skateboarding grew. But the rad thing that was, was our checks were going to. We became hugely successful for our ages. When things started to take off, I was about 16, 17, when suddenly it was a genuine income and a genuine career. Hawk with the in the air! So we were starting to make a lot of money in the late 80s, and uh, and that was all because of all the popularity of skateboarding and all the fans that were dedicated to uh, you know supporting our brand. I bought my first house when I was 17, still a senior in high school. It seemed insane because we were making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year as teenagers and traveling the world and we had adoration and we had success and that can be very uh, toxic for someone our age, for sure. A lot of young athletes who get a lot of money, you know, they completely blow it. He kept his head together, you know, he, he was a, a young adult pretty early. I think our only mistake was that we thought it was endless. And so we approached our spending and our life as if it was never gonna end and it ended very quickly. He was making six figures and then he was making no figures. I was left with two mortgages, a son on the way, and everything felt very scary. There was a time in the late 80s where everyone wanted our autograph, and when the 90s came in, nobody wanted our autograph. Tony Hawk is the uh, reigning skateboard champion, has been now for, is that true, eight years? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I guess I won the last, uh, yeah, eight years of the NSA championship. Around 1991 is when we started to feel the pinch of skateboarding's popularity starting to wane. 90s came around and skateboarding just went pew, dropped super big. I was left with two mortgages a son on the way, and everything felt very scary. Our board sales went from like $15,000 a month to like, am I even gonna sell boards this month? My income was literally dropping in by half every month because I was based on royalties. He was making six figures and then he was making no figures. Like really quickly with a young family. 
what can I do to rearrange my life so that I can continue to skate? And it was more just cutting living expenses and taking every single job that came along. And, and that means like, I would go do demos in Six Flags parking lots for a week in St. Louis and get paid $100 a day for three skate shows a day. It was a time in the late 80s where everyone wanted our autograph. And when the 90s came in, nobody wanted our autograph. I look back at it, I don't look at it as a struggle. It was just more of a necessity. And I was still getting to skate for a living. I could sense that skateboarding was starting to come back a little bit in popularity in about 1995 because I started getting more calls to do exhibitions. He actually leaned into the sport and got a second mortgage on his house and started a skateboard company. What was the turning point where all of a sudden this turned into a money machine? Well, around that time, just before the X Games, I started my own skateboard brand, even though that seemed like the worst idea in the world. The reason I started Birdhouse was because I thought my career was ending as, as a pro skater, and I wanted to curate my own team because I felt like I had a good eye for talent. We put together a solid team, we went on tour, we would all share one hotel room, six of us to a van, show up at a parking lot of a skate shop, skate for an hour. He was kind of living off of his wife's income and you know, he had this Taco Bell allowance where he wasn't allowed to have fancy meals. That's it. I had sprained my ankle at the demo before the one we were going to and I thought I'm gonna push through, I'm gonna do this. I sprained my other ankle at that demo and so as I'm driving away from the demo, I am driving with ice on this angle and thinking, is this, is this it? That was one of the hardest times. And, and, and definitely a defining moment in that I ended up skating um, with ankle braces on and making it work and off we went. I would say 1998 was sort of the turning point for me in terms of having more opportunity, more um, offers, more endorsements, when suddenly Bagel Bites and Club Med were calling me, you know, I knew something was up where this is a whole different beast. When I started working for Tony, I felt that he needed the kinds of things that anybody who's having any kind of fame, I don't care what kind of celebrity it is, uh, he would need management, he would need an agent, he would need a publicist for sure. I don't think a lot of people understood skateboarding in that they thought it was more like being a frisbee champion or a yo-yo champion. And so a lot of what our work was together was about educating the media on the detail that goes into skate. And that's when things really took off in terms of, not not necessarily just financially, but, but in terms of establishing that we have that sort of value, that we have that sort of reach as, as skateboarders and, and as action sports stars, so to speak, and that um, this is serious business. I think Tony Hawk is like at the forefront of action sports. And I think a lot of marketing people and TV people thought, this is a guy we can get behind, good looking, talented, and he's really good on a skateboard. ESPN created the first X Games, which would, they called the Extreme Games. Tony was kind of like the role model for ESPN and the X Games, and um, it really projected who he was in the industry outside the people who didn't really care about skateboarding at the time. At that point in my life, I had competed for 20 years. It was like, I don't want to, this to, I don't want this to define my life. They decided they were gonna have a best trick event. I had a strategy because I knew that there was one trick that I could do. I made that trick very early on. And then I went to an even harder trick and I made that one within a few tries. And then it was like, where do I go from here? And the announcer said something like, hey, what about, what about a 900? Pulling off a 900 in itself is very dangerous because it is such a hard trick to rotate and then to land on your skateboard coming back downhill down the ramp. The reason it's so hard is because you're spinning two and a half times in the air, so you need to get plenty of height. And when you get that much height, you are blind to your landing twice. This is a trick that uh, not just Tony, but a lot of guys have been chasing for 10 plus years. <laughs> So bad. Tried a few. Around after the fourth or fifth time, I realized that I had a consistent spin. The amount of attempts he tried, and it was on national TV, and it was over and over again. Time expired by the time he was like on his fourth or fifth try, and then 
he was just about him. He was just starting to get into the zone. Anybody that knows him well knows the look. I don't know where he's getting this energy. You can see us before he drops in for his run, like doing this, like <laughs> the magical vibes over his head. He said to himself, I'm either going to make this trick or I'm going to go to the hospital in ambulance. It was the right place at the right time. And it was a monumental trick in skateboarding, you know, two and a half rotations above a half pipe. No one had ever done it before um, in the sport, and uh, it just catapulted his career. The fans just pushed down the gate, and they all stormed the half pipe, and they lifted him up in the air and carried him around, and it was really incredible. Lord, for you people, I would never made that. Thank you. Thank you. This is the best day of my life. Truly one of the biggest moments in action sports and technically had nothing to do with the contest. It was one guy trying to make a trick. We started working on uh, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, I'm pretty sure in early 1998. Nobody really thought that this game was gonna be a gigantic hit. It was supposed to be sort of a, you know, a, a nice little knockoff skateboarding game with Tony Hawk and a few other skaters. As Activision started getting closer to release, they felt like they had a hit on their hands, and so they offered me a flat buyout of $500,000 for future royalties. I just said to Tony, and he said to me, what, you know, what do they know at Activision that we don't know? I had never heard anyone speak the words half a million dollars to me, so to me it just sounded like a gazillion billion, like it seemed unreal that anyone would offer that. And so I told him, I go, no, I want to let it ride. I believe the first game did in excess of 9 million units, which back then was just gigantic. I mean, it was huge. Right after I denied that offer, they started talking about a sequel. The technology was there, and it captured, I guess, the essence of skateboarding. But Pro Skater 1 and 2 were enormous, not only financially for Tony, but he involved so many people that he was friends with. And I think that's why the skateboarding community embraced him so much. It wasn't just about him. He brought so many people along for the ride. The whole video game thing brought skateboarding to a whole other level. That was a real game changer. And that's where Tony couldn't really walk through an airport anymore. Tony couldn't sit and have a meal without a group of people coming over to the table for autographs. I don't have the number number on actual units of games sold. I know that they've done over a billion in sales, um, and, and absolutely I've seen my fair share of that, but I'm in no way a billionaire <laughs> from our video game. So Tony Hawk, what you get with him if you, you hitch your wagon to Tony Hawk as a brand, is you get one of the most influential skateboarders. You get a guy that's progressing the sport, and he's an icon. Between my sister and I, we started a few businesses. We started all kinds of things because we felt there was a broad audience. Tony Hawk Incorporated has five divisions, ranging from skateboards and apparel to arena tours. Your branded product sold more than $275 million last year. Hawk clothing. Yeah, Hawk clothing was cool. I mean, it was just another bizarre thing, just seeing a bunch of people wearing your name, you know, and I still see it to this day, it's pretty funny. A 900 Films, Ride Channel, Boom Boom Huck Jam Tour. The skating culture is a bit anti-establishment. Did you worry about being a sellout when you became a CEO? I don't ever believe that, that Hawk has ever been a sellout of anything. I, mean, I think he believes in everything that he does, and he doesn't do it for money. He does it for the passion of it, and the money is just the, the icing of the cake. You had told me uh, up until my 30s that skateboarding might be an Olympic sport, I would never have believed you. Thanks for coming out for the uh, Tony Hawk Foundation Guacamigo Grand Opening. Whoa! I made some key investments in recent years, mostly because I, I, I do want to have some sort of exit strategy from all this. And uh, it's mostly just how do I choose it? It's, it's intuitive. I invested in Nest before they were bought, and I invested in Blue Bottle Coffee, and then 
Nestle bought a controlling stake of that and, and cashed us out. And then a few tech startups as well, Homebay. I have a few other like restaurant type of stuff here in San Diego, um, one in Newport, Guacamigos. I want to thank uh, Guacamigos and Michael Nicole for supporting Tony Hawk Foundation. Like he said, we've been doing the work for the last 18 years now. In the late 1990s, early 2000s, he was making really good money. I think it was my sister, Pat, who said, you know, maybe it's time to actually start giving back to this sport that's given you so much. And so I went to him and said, give me a cause. And he goes, well, I get, and right off the top of his head, he said, I'll tell you a cause. They're building skate parks in cities, and they don't know what they're doing. For the most part, the skate parks were built in more affluent areas. They weren't designed very well. They clearly weren't in consultation with the local skaters on the design. I thought I could change that. We decided to create the Tony Hawk Foundation. What we're going to do was help to fund the construction of skate parks in low-income areas all, all around the nation. We kind of started on a whim. We, uh, the, the seed money came from my appearance on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Celebrity Edition. And uh, we just started figuring out how to make our resources go the furthest because our money doesn't necessarily build an entire skate park, but it usually gives them the endorsement they need to get more funding. Tony's not only giving, especially low income areas, a place to do it, but lending his expertise in how to get it done, in raising the money to do it, in the design process, the planning process. I think 35% of the skate parks in America have somehow been touched by Tony's foundation. Among the six to eight million dollars that we've given away, uh, that has actually helped to gain over 100 million in other funding. And we come to you live from the red carpet in Monaco for the Laurier Sports Awards 2019. Well, the Laris World Sports Academy is an organisation of former athletes. We're a group of 68 men and women um, who are trying to make a, dif a difference uh, to this world through sport. How vital is sport for good for the world, let alone for the world of sports? Part of the Loris Academy is that we do this, this work for kids in underprivileged areas, trying to get them into sports of all kinds. And uh, I've seen a lot of the work firsthand and, and I believe in it. Tony and I went to Sierra Leone just after the finish of the Civil War. And the things that he was doing with the kids on the skateboard was just phenomenal. The smiles that brought to their faces and uh, just really brought home how important sport is. Tokyo will host the 2020 Summer Games with new events bringing even more athletes together on the world stage. We're delighted to confirm officially baseball, softball, karate, skateboard. If you had told me up until my 30s that skateboarding might be an Olympic sport, I would never have believed you. It just seemed too, too avant-garde, too edgy, uh, too unstructured, and that's what I loved about it. Skateboarding going to the Olympics in 2020, there are gonna be people that are gonna say, we don't wanna be a part of it, it's too corporate. And as long as the sport feels like it's being taken care of. I think Tony will be one of those guys at the forefront of that to make sure that the sport is taken care of and not taken advantage of. The Olympics need skateboarding more than skateboarding needs the Olympics. This could do for your summer games what snowboarding has done for your winter games. Um, and at this point, like, you need our cool factor more than we need your validation. And I was saying that openly to the IOC. Um, and uh, they, they made it happen. It worked. And I'm glad it's finally happened. I think Tony had a big part to do with that. I see the Olympics getting so much respect towards skateboarding that it brings it into the schools. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, skateboarding is one of those sports that you can do anywhere. It's a, it's a low investment sport and uh, it's good fun. One of the interesting things about Tony's career is that he's a multi-generational performer, and so he has a following of tweens, teens, young adults, and then older people that have grown up with him and had posters of Tony on their walls. Tony Hawk has just been good for the sport because the sport has been good to him, and he's given back so much, whether it's through his foundation, whether it's through contests, whether it's sponsoring athletes, he has been good for a sport that has been very good to him. He's still skating, and you know, putting him, putting it all on the line when he clearly doesn't have to, and he's been doing it for 30 years plus, and just, you know, slam after slam, still getting up, still doing it, just because he loves it. And I'm just glad that it is Tony Hawk, that, that that was a person that was chosen by 
our industry and chosen by his, the fans. And out of everyone that I've ever met in our sport, um, he, he's the right guy for it. The fact that he's, he's willing to carry that flag into a lot of public arenas and uh, take all the heat that comes with that, that's, that, that's a, a whole different kind of bravery. Um, but it's courageous as hell. That was a responsibility that I was happy to take on because I felt like I do speak openly and honestly about skating and what you see is what you get. I'm 50, like I get it. I'm not the most relevant skater. I've lived it. I've lived it my whole life. It, it has become my life in a lot of ways. <laughs>